Great. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to my fellow colleagues in Scotland today. Uh, Solis is excited to be doing this webinar for you, and we look forward to an extensive Q&A session. Uh, we have just a few slides to share with you uh, before we go into the live demo. And uh, wanted to share for some of you that have already seen a previous uh, demo of the uh, Solus Library app. I think you'll be impressed with some of the new features we've added since the last time you've seen it. We are very consortia friendly and we look forward to sharing some of the lessons learned and some of the developments we've done that speak to consortia and certainly share uh, qualifies for having all of those little details taken care of. Uh, on the call today, I'm based in Utica, New York, and my colleagues, Neil Wishart is the CEO and Andrew Day is the CTO. They're the uh, co-founders of Solus and they'll be participating in today's presentation. So Andrew, if you could fire up the uh, share PowerPoint and then we'll have a few comments from Neil, please. Yeah. Sorry, Andrew, can I actually share my screen? Uh, I've got a PowerPoint here. Well, you guys um, get that ready. I will just um, interject and give us a bit of a background on Solus and on the share process, if that would be okay. Um, so welcome everyone. I, I wanted to um, just welcome everyone to learn more about this Solus app. So in the last several years, we have been considering a share mobile app. And so um, the Share E-Resources Committee was tasked with re reviewing mobile app vendors to determine what would best fit for our group. And so the pro this process has actually taken over, over a year, but after careful consideration, Solus was determined to have the best app for our consortium. And so you may be wondering, why are we even considering an app? We do have the mobile optimized pack. Well, patrons are using phones and mobile devices to, to conduct their day-to-day -day business online. And so there is a new expectation for data to be easily accessible. And so we did pull some data. Um, Pre-COVID, the mobile access to our pack was about 12%. It started increasing um, in early 2020. And so it was looking more like 18% to 79% accessing via the desktop. But today we're actually seeing about 31% accessing the um, pack with a mobile device, which is a huge increase. And so I do want to recognize that there is a generational gap here where maybe some seniors are still uncomfortable with smartphones or mo more mobile technology. And so they're still using their home PCs, but the shift is starting and to remain competitive, we absolutely want to make sure that we're offering an innovative discovery system. And so um, when I say competitive, who is our competitors? It used to be maybe our local bookstore or in the smaller towns that their grocery store or drugstore would sell books. And so it's always been the competition for for-profit marketplace, but now we're competing with Amazon and Netflix. At the Metro East legislative update um, on Monday, we had a representative saying that they're seeing students at the McDonald's franchises. So now McDonald's is our competitor. And so how are they providing information to their customers? So we're seeing digital delivery, mobile ordering and curbside delivery all with apps. And so when you're comparing our service, we need to look towards the future. Um, I also wanna mention that data in an app is actual, actually better in rural or disadvantaged communities because most people do have a phone, even if they don't have a desktop computer or a laptop. It also can be accessed easier with less bandwidth. And so if they don't have internet at home, they still may have that um, the cell phone signal for the cell networks. And so um, those apps, um, while we do have that mobile optimized service, it's actually very subpar to the access as Solus is gonna show us. Um, I also wanna mention that the Share Finance and Policy Committee has also been very active in um, the process as well. And they have determined that, you know, of course you're probably wondering, and the first thing I always think of is can we afford it? And so I know you wanna know how that's going to affect share fees. And so um, we are going to be presenting this for member comment um, after uh, the, the recording today, we'll be sending that out. And so since our share fees were recently evaluated, the committee felt that it'd be best for the base app to be paid for via our reserve fund 
um, for capital improvements so that we have that set up for technology upgrades for three years. At the end of that time period, the committee is going to reevaluate the share fees in total, but they have determined that they will cap um, any increase for the mobile app to less than $100 per agency. And so you may be asking why, and it's because the share committees believe so strongly that this is the way that we need to reach our customers where they are. And so with that, um, it's going to be part of the total share package for everyone. And so we are able to use um, the power of our group to make it affordable. And so just in comparison, um, Belleville Public Library has a product called Boopsy, which was bought by Solus. And so under their contract, they pay $4,000 per year. So again, the, the power of the SHARE program allows us to receive some top of the line technology at just at a fraction of the price. So, and just to explain, so I did say for the base app, so that would be for everyone. A template um, would cost an additional fee if you wanted to in integrate some additional e-resources, but the root would work for everyone. Um, and it, it would include also Cloud Library, but if you had Hoopla or Overdrive, for example, um, you may wanna consider adding some additional template, an additional template for your library. And so I just wanted to start us out with that so everybody understands how we are going to um, propose paying for it as you're evaluating the app and evaluating what it would look like for us. So, um, Thank you so much, JR, for letting me interject that, and I will go ahead and turn it back over to you. Okay, right. Cassandra, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, as uh, JR said at the start, he, uh, he's asked me to give a bit of an intro uh, to Solus, uh, who we are, and also touch on uh, why an app versus uh, responsive web. Uh, and that actually leads on very nicely from uh, what you were talking about there in terms of uh, what your competition are doing and what the expectations uh, are of your uh, patrons. So with no further ado, uh, I'll run through this, then I'll pass across to Andrew to give a, a demo of the application. Just a bit of background on Solus. Uh, Solus, uh, small to medium enterprise based out of Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, we have offices in Melbourne, Australia, and now with uh, JR heading up the team in the US. We also work closely with a number of ILS vendors in the marketplace. So uh, probably the biggest in North America that we're working with uh, is Cersei Dynix, uh, who resell the app as uh, Blue Cloud Mobile. We also work with Innovative and are, are expanding uh, outwards from there. Uh, just to give you a, a kind of view of scale, there are a number of players in the marketplace, uh, one of which was Boopsy, uh, who used to be the largest, but they'd lost an awful lot of customers over the last few years to the likes of Blue Cloud Mobile and other uh, products. Uh, now Solus is by far the, the largest globally uh, with over six and a half, sorry, five and a half thousand uh, library locations live currently uh, on five continents. We have customers right across the world. Uh, there are further uh, almost 640 sites in testing, uh, which will bring us to well over 6,000 live sites. So it's uh, growing rapidly. Uh, as part of the interna internationalization, the app is currently available in 25 languages. And again, that's something that we're committed to growing all the time. Uh, so it's very good where you have pockets of a population uh, whose first language is not English. Uh, obviously, in North America, there are, that's the case in a lot of areas. Spanish is being very widely spoken, but also a number of other local languages. Uh, we found it interesting when Cersei Dynix uh, started selling the application to find pockets of different speakers in different parts of the country. So uh, I can't remember which site Andrew might be able to help me. Uh, one site that had a very large Russian population. Uh, locally and that was a required language so the good news is if there are any languages locally that are not on the list uh, we can get them translated and added in quickly uh, as well as the professional translation at uh, the app level in terms of all of the sort of core functionality any local content uploaded either uh, you know, a consortia wide app level or also where a library opts to have an individual template uh, can also be machine translated as well. So you can have that content in whichever language you want. Uh, as I said, uh, we work with a number of ILS vendors, but we also 
closely integrate with e-content and program and events platforms as well. Uh, and uh, for self-service, we can do self-service via uh, barcode or uh, with RFID using the NFC chip on mobile devices. Just to give you, uh, again, this relates very much to what Cassandra was saying. Uh, App usage uh, globally is very, very high uh, and as a percentage of mobile media time it is significant in comparison with uh, the time spent from a mobile device on websites. Uh, again, from the same study, uh, this just gives you a percentage uh, of mobile minutes as a percentage of total digital minutes. Uh, so uh, you can see here that uh, the terms of time spent is very, very high uh, in relation to users on a desktop or whatever. And when, it look, when you start to look at mobile web versus mobile app, again, people on mobile devices are spending the vast majority of their time on uh, apps as opposed to uh, responsive web. And then again, uh, looking at this percentage, but adding in tablets as well as smartphones, uh, you can see that uh, how the, how this breaks down there as well. But as opposed to just the industry level stats, again, uh, why would you look at an app versus responsive web? Well, there's a number of things that apps can do that currently responsive web can't. Uh, so you can access the camera uh, on a device for scanning barcodes, whether they be patron uh, barcodes, whether they be library barcodes or ISBNs. There's a number of things uh, that we can do there. So an example would be uh, if a patron is in a bookstore and wants to scan an ISBN to see if borrow it in the library prior to purchasing the book and uh, that would be an example of how that can be used. Then uh, I mentioned self-service apps can use NFC for communicating uh, with RFID tags to uh, read and write data to the tag and also to turn off and then back on the security uh, on the tag as well. We can use device notifications for starting to push information about loans etc and when things are due back uh, and we can also integrate with operating system provided payment services, so things like Apple Pay and Google Pay. I should say at that point that currently Apple Pay and Google Pay are not available within the application, uh, but this is something that will be added this year. Uh, and again, one of the key things and reasons for our growth is uh, being able to act quickly and get the, these services out. Uh, Payment services such as Apple and Google Pay are perfect for libraries where they do take payments for, you know, whether it be uh, charges or fines. Uh, uh, this is something that's uh, there's becoming less of, but it's a very convenient way for people to uh, make small amounts, uh, small payments. Uh, yeah, and, and lastly, again, Cassandra's highlighted this. People expect an app now on their mobile device. They're using uh, apps to get coffees in Starbucks, to place orders in McDonald's or whatever it may be. It's just an expectation, certainly uh, by younger users, that this will be the way that they'll interact with organizations. So with that, uh, I'll pass across to Andrew uh, to then run through the demo. Thanks, Neil. I'm just going to share my screen. Give me one second. So hopefully you can see my screen from my phone. I'm going to open up the app for Track, which is a consort Polaris consortium uh, in Alberta in Canada. So I want to show this one first because of something that was touched on a minute ago in terms of templates. So uh, the app itself is designed to work really well uh, with consortia. So I've installed uh, the app here from the Track consortium. So you can see it has the consortium branding uh, on the app icon. Uh, that's what you search for in the App Store to install it. Uh, and that's what you see when you first open the app. There's some elements here that I'll go through in a minute on, on our demo app, but that includes things like on the home screen, such as the search at the top of the home screen, uh, the carousel that you see kind of rolling across uh, the middle there, uh, and then some, uh, some functions that you see beneath that. And these are customizable sections within the app. And, and each app can have, have different uh, functions that you can customize to, to add onto that home screen there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sign into uh, a library account. And this uh, account that I'm going to sign into belongs to a particular library service. So my 
uh, user at my home location is set to uh, Marigold Libraries, which is part of the track consortium. Lots of zeros in there, login. And then if I enter my pin number, you can then simply sign into the app. And you can see at this point, the app then completely reloads with a different set of branding. Uh, it's actually a different set of um, books on the carousel there and uh, a different set of tabs on the home screen. Now, in this case, it is actually pretty similar to what is uh, available in the, the root app and the consortium, but it can be completely customized for that particular library system. Now, a library system, in their case, has uh, multiple library locations beneath that. So uh, this user is a member of a specific library as part of the Marigold uh, library system, but templates can be applied to individual library locations as well is determined by the, the kind of organizational tree within Polaris, uh, and it can be applied to either a group of libraries or a specific individual uh, library location. In this case, it's a group of libraries. But now that I've signed in, the, the content can be completely different uh, to what um, is, is shown on the home screen uh, of, the, uh, of the, the consortium wide app. So that's the consortium root template um, that you saw before I signed in. And now I've signed in, you can see my barcode, um, and I can always have always have access to that when I'm in the library. I'm going to come out of that app just now and go into our demo app. So I've signed in here to our demo app, but there's a variety of different functions I want to show you. And a couple of things uh, straight off the bat, uh, the, the home screen display can be slightly different and can be customized by the user. And you as a library service can choose the default. So here I'm using the scrolling display in the track app it was set to sliding uh, left and right. So it's a kind of paged display, um, but that's customizable uh, on a per template basis. So what do we have within the app? First thing right at the top, we have the branding. So in this case, it just says library app, which isn't particularly exciting, but as you saw before, that would be uh, either the consortium branding at the root level uh, or the individual branding of the library service if you have a, a template. If the library doesn't have a template, so if you choose opt not to take a template, then the user would stay on the, the root template branding, so the consortium branding, um, even after they've logged in. So that's that's what I'm seeing here. Uh, there, are, there are some options for customizations for libraries, even if you don't have a, a template and you can put up your own content and that will appear under your library branch listing uh, within the app. So right at the top, I have a search screen. So I'm gonna tap into that and I'm gonna search for uh, the book which must not be named. So I can see that the library has a number of different copies in different formats. The search display shows me some key information right off the top. So we've got the title, the author, the format, and the publication date. These are the, the most used uh, pieces of metadata that, that, that patrons look for. So we have that right there, along with the, the book jackets showing right uh, in the cover there. If it is a physical title, um, I can open that item and I can see the details for that title. There's a variety of information that we can pull out from uh, the catalog if, if that is in your catalog. Uh, we can see the holdings. In this case, they've only got one copy, uh, uh, an imaginatively titled branch called Branch. Um, and that's the, <laughs> that's the benefit of using a demo app here. Um, and I can place a hold on that item. Now you can see that says place reservation and that's because I have my device set to uh, English UK or English Ireland, and that's, we use terminology reservation. Obviously, if your device is set to English US, then it would be uh, place hold. Uh, and the, the, the terminology will depend, obviously, on the, the language set that you're using. But if the, the library service or the consortium wants to change that, everything, everything text-based within the app can be changed. Uh, and that's not just, uh, obviously, for uh, other languages, but also your default language, in this case, uh, English. So all that text can be changed at any time through the CMS. So it's a physical title. I could uh, place a hold for it. It'll take me to, to obviously the, the choose my pickup location. I can place that hold. I'll not do that right now. Uh, but also if it's a, an electronic title uh, and it is currently available, um, I can uh, opt to check it out and download it immediately. Uh, depending on the content provider uh, in question, uh, we can either open that title directly within uh, the app um, so for likes of Overdrive, we can open that directly. Uh, for other content providers such as Cloud Library, which I know that the, the consortium has a, has a contract with, uh, we can take the user across to the Cloud Library app 
uh, to, to access that title. And that just depends on the DRM that's in use by the particular content vendors and what they support. So uh, you, can, you can take the find the item, you can take the transactional step, uh, but then for the actual consumption, it's, it's across to the content vendors app. In terms of my account, I can see both my physical and my digital content in my account. If I tap the hamburger icon at the top right corner of the app, I can see uh, my account. There's a little welcome message there for me. Um, and I can see my, and again, as I said, loans and reservations, very uh, UK specific terminology there. Um, that would be checkouts and holds uh, with a, an English US device. So I can see uh, my checkouts and I can see uh, the options that I have here. So this is a physical title. So the only option there is uh, to renew that title or I can go in to, to view that item in uh, in the library catalog, I can also see my checkout history and I can take actions across all of my, um, my checkouts that I have there. If I go into my holds, I can see uh, the items that I have placed on hold. These are all just uh, currently at placed. And that terminology again will change depending on your, uh, the ILS in use, obviously. Um, it could be you know ready for pickup or being held, etc. Uh, and that can all be uh, customized. So if I go into this particular uh, hold here, I can see I've got a few different options here. I can change a pickup location. I can suspend it or cancel that hold. Um, and again, that's a, a physical title. So I have those options for electronic titles and the, the options can change depending on what's supported by uh, the e-content vendor. Other things I can see in here, I can see uh, my fines. And uh, if there are payment options, we can see that. Right now, this is, there are no payment options currently available uh, for this particular library service. Uh, I can see the devices that I have this account signed in as, and uh, that's really useful in terms of if you have multiple devices, you can see all of your devices that the library account is, is signed into. Um, if, for example, you have it signed into an iPad as well as an iPhone, you lose that iPad or it's stolen, you can deactivate or deauthorize that other device from your library account without having to change your pen, you know, in case you don't want to do that. Um, you can just deauthorize that other device and it deletes the account of that other device. With linked accounts, uh, we can add in uh, other uh, patron accounts. So let's say I've got my kids' accounts, I can add those in here and then I can see uh, all of my, um, all of the checkouts across both my account and, and the kids' accounts. Uh, in a single view within the, the checkouts display. And the same goes for uh, holds and for fines. And when you're placing a hold, you then have the option um, to choose uh, which account you're placing that hold against if you have multiple accounts uh, signed in. Uh, under preferences, we have the ability to reorder the icons that are on the home screen. So this is the patron has the ability to reorder those. So if I decide actually the book a PC link and self check are the most important things to me as a user uh, within the app, then I can put those right to the top. I have that option to change the home page layout as well. Uh, if I go back out of preferences, I can see that the first two items now are book a PC and self check as I've reordered them. So the library or consortium has the ability to set the default order for those icons, but the patron has the ultimate control as to um, the order of those icons on their device. Um, however, if you have something that's really important that you want to appear right at the top, then as the as the uh, administrator, you can decide that that's a pinned tab and that will always appear uh, at the top if there's some sort of important announcement or a really important feature you want to, to push out there to your patrons. So I've got my carousel. I can tap on any of those items and go straight through to the, the catalog record for that particular uh, item. Uh, if I tap more, um, I can see if there, are, if there are multiple carousels that the library has defined, uh, you can see those appear um, in uh, the display. So we have a young adults one there and there's another one. So uh, you can define those um, different carousels. So those, those carousels can be defined either through ISBNs or individual records, or if you have a record set that you want to have appear within uh, the uh, with, uh, as the carousel, you can uh, define a uh, record set and specify just the record set ID. So as you change that record set in Polaris, then the, the carousel will automatically update within the app. So it's a really easy way to keep that up to date, keep it fresh and, and, and keep the content interesting for your patrons.
Moving on down to the different sections underneath the carousel, as I said before, these are customizable and you can define uh, through our content management system what you want these sections to be on your app or in your template, if you have a template for your library. Uh, so you can define different sections, different tabs. It can be hierarchical as well. So if I go into eBooks and eAudio, um, I can see oh, that one's actually a search for eBooks and eAudio. If I go into online resources, uh, I can see I've got a list of different content, but if I wanted to do say eBooks and eAudiobooks or uh, databases under there and then go into databases and then see a list of elements, we can do that as well. And these can link out to all the various different services that you have. So in terms of consortia, you would only want to show elements in here that everyone within the consortium has access to. Uh, you would show obviously um, uh, group subscriptions or consortium level, level con subscriptions um, within here. With a template as an individual library or library service, then you obviously have the ability to specify your subscription. So if you've subscribed to something separate from the consortium, then you can, can put that in there uh, under your template. Uh, if I go into nearest libraries, we can see a listing of all the different libraries uh, within or different library locations within uh, the app. Um, with a template, you can obviously choose to uh, opt to only show your own local locations or opt to show the locations of, of everyone within uh, the consortium or have it as two levels. So you have your own ones first and then see all the rest of the, the, the libraries. So there's, there's multiple options there in terms of um, configuration, but it will always show me the, the nearest library to me first. Um, so if I go into a particular library, I can see that library is about to close, so it's showing in, in yellow. Uh, we have the opening hours, we have the location, the, the patron can, can view it on a map or get directions, uh, contact the library. All of this is configurable through the content management system, so it's all completely changeable at any time. Uh, you can also create content and schedule up to appear underneath your library. So I could create a PDF file, perhaps um, a flyer for uh, something that's happening in the library or a service that the library has. I can schedule that in the content management system and I can have that appear at the bottom of the library page there. Now that doesn't require you to have a template. Um, the user, the, the, the library can have a, a login to the CMS and just have access to their channel. And that content will appear under their channel um, no matter which template the user is, is signed in, whether it's the root template, if you don't have your own, or if they're signed into, um, if they're a member of a different library and um, they have a different template, then the channels will still be there. So any content that you specify for your library will appear uh, under your library's page, uh, no matter which template you have there. So if I come back out of nearest libraries, it's various different things on here. So I've got things such as uh, latest news from the library. So this could be an RSS feed, uh, allowing the, the patron to link through to the, the news stories. Same goes for events, uh, if I go into what's on. So in this case, I'm linking out to a web page, but again, if your uh, event system has an RSS feed, uh, and again, if you have your own template, you may want to have your own uh, local event system uh, linked in here uh, under your template. And uh, again, from a consortium level, a root level, you can have multiple um, tiers within uh, that particular tab. So if you want to have um, uh, different events from, from different areas, you could have that. Or uh, if you have uh, different events feeds for uh, different uh, ages of users. So if you have a, an adult events feed and you have a teens events feed and a, um, a kids events feed, you could have all those uh, linked to uh, and being pulled into the app uh, directly as an RSS feed. Uh, and then last one at the bottom there, survey. So that's just a, a link out to uh, a web page. In this case, a Survey Monkey link. Uh, it looks like it's all part of the app, so it's all kind of encapsulated within the app. They're not you know, tossed, tossed out to a browser, uh, but the user can can see that and and could uh, take part in that survey, all as part of uh, within looks like within the app. Um, but it's actually a web page that's being pulled in uh, into the app. So I'm just gonna come back out of that there. Some other features we've got, such as uh, scan the ISBN barcode that, that Neil mentioned earlier, where you can uh, scan an ISBN and see if it's available in the library. Uh, an e-books and e-audio search, so that's a specific search against uh, the ILS for that format, um, book a PC that you saw there as well. Uh, and the last one, I just want to touch on a couple of additional features that, that are reasonably new to the app, so we launched in the last um, six to 12 months. So self-check uh, allows you to check out or check in items um, 
to the library. Uh, so when I'm in a library, it, it picks up my GPS and determines I'm in a library location that has cell check enabled. So it has to be enabled on a per location basis. So I'm in a location that has cell check enabled. Um, it will allow me to either check out or check in items. Again, that is uh, configurable on a per location basis. So if you only want to do checkout, then you can do that. If you only want to check in, you can do that or you can do both. Um, so if I say I want to, to check out within the library, um, it will allow me to either tap the phone on an RFID tag and uh, check out that item. So it checks it out against the ILS, then it deactivates the security uh, on their RFID tag and the user can, can walk out the door. Um, same process in reverse. For check-in, you tap your phone on the RFID tag. Uh, it immediately re reactivates the security on the tag and then checks it in against uh, the ILS. Uh, we also have an additional check with check-in using a, a Bluetooth beacon. So that has to be within the library and the user has to be within a specific set distance of that beacon to ensure that they are definitely in the library and not just kind of loitering outside um, the library and, and using the, the service. So there's a number of different checks there to, to enable uh, check-in uh, as well as check-out. So I'm just gonna come out of that. And then the, the last thing um, under uh, reservations in, in my display here, but it would be holds, um, is the click and collect process. So if I have a hold that's ready for pickup, uh, I'll see an additional button at the top here, just beneath where it says all reservations and select. Um, it would say uh, curbside pickup or click and collect or whatever it is you want to call that service. When I tap that, it will then take me through um, a process to use our real time, no reservation curbside pickup module, which allows the staff uh, to manage that process using a staff dashboard. And when the, the user says, I'm on my way to the library in real time, the staff will see you know, the people that are on the way to the library, they can pull those items off the pickup shelf. Um, and then when the, the user arrives at the library, the, the, the library will get continual um, updates as to the, the location of that, or the, 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 the ETA of that user. The, we, we don't ever see their location, but the ETA of that user. And as part of that, uh, you can know obviously when a user is about to uh, arrive uh, at uh, the library and then check those items out uh, through the staff dashboard. You don't have to go off to a separate um, software or anything else, all through the staff dashboard, check those items out and have them ready for the user when they arrive uh, at the library. So it's a really nice, a really um, slick uh, real-time curbside pickup solution. Um, it's, it, I would say it's probably more akin to likes of a Starbucks type model where I say, hey, I'm coming to get my coffee and you then have it ready to go uh, when you arrive at the live, uh, at the coffee shop. In this case, it's having your, your holds ready to go when you arrive uh, at the library. And it really fits into the existing uh, holds pickup model that the, the ILS has. And that allows you to um, use the existing processes and workflows that the library has in terms of users placing holds, those items being pulled from the shelf and those holds being filled, you know, ready for pickup. And only at that point can the user um, enter the, the curbside pickup process. So it's not a case of someone saying, I want an item and I'm on my way to the library and you've got 10 minutes to go and find it off the shelves. It's already uh, off the shelf and it's already in the um, on, on the pickup shelf ready to go for that user uh, as part of the standard holds pick up and, and hold fill process that the, the ILS has. So I think that's everything that I wanted to cover here. I'll just quickly bring up the languages just to give you a flavor for all the different languages that the app now supports. I think there are 24 different languages plus another nine um, variants of languages. So as you can see here, I have English Ireland and English United Kingdom uh, as two options. Um, there's obviously uh, English, US, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. Um, so they're they're kind of the the the, the variants of the, the different languages. So there's there's a lot of customization uh, and a lot of um, configuration there uh, in terms of um, really making the app uh, appropriate for your for your patrons. Okay, I can see there's a lot of questions in the chat that I haven't looked at yet. So. I'm just going to bring that up just now. If there's any, if there's any um, questions that anyone wants to to ask um, audibly as well, I don't know if we want to do that, um, but I'm happy to look through the questions in the chat. Yeah. Or yeah. Neil and Jr. If you have anything you want to 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 highlight first off. Yes, there's been some good uh, questions regarding templates, mm -hmm. and uh, 
we might have a little discussion on that. The way IHLS slash share is looking at this is sort of deploying a consortia wide app and they've done a great job of educating the member libraries what share is from that perspective. And that's very important because as an app goes into the store, the patrons need to search for an app in the store. And in this case, it would be share or IHLS share, whatever uh, would be appropriate. So that's kind of the, the baseline there. And as Andrew showcased, once the app is uh, downloaded, the first time a patron logs in, if there's an associated template, then the, the iconography, the background, foreground colors, uh, logo, et cetera, will flip uh, forevermore to the home library. A couple of quick uh, thoughts on that, uh, because share is so large. Uh, in track, for example, they have 178 member libraries. The majority of them are very small, single location, but there are a few that have multiple branches. And in their rollout, they have, I think, four templates currently, and they might evolve to say 10 to 15 member libraries within their group that would go for individual templates. A template means that, yes, we have our own branding, but you can also link uh, perhaps overdrive content or Hoopla content that Andrew was showcasing, a link to calendar or programs events that's for that specific library. Uh, etc. If we look at someone close to you in the neighborhood uh, through our partner Circe Dynex, the SWAN consortium chose to deploy individual templates for their 97 or 98 member libraries. So everyone got a template uh, from that perspective. Perhaps a dialogue with some of those folks in the back room might give some pros or cons from the administration side of that and the, the uh, uh, deployment and sustainability discussions. But certainly the software allows for templates to be created for every library or a portion of libraries. Uh, there was another good question, sort of the variations between some of the academic institutions and the K to 12 market. And uh, before I pass it back to Andrew that may expound on some of these options, if there were templates for K to 12 district or for uh, uh, an academic, then certainly they can manage their own content, kind of like Polaris where you have sub tiers and there's a limited amount of customization that can be done at the template level where you would never impact the root or the IHLS share level. Uh, Andrew, anything else to kind of add in the... Yeah, that's correct, Joe. That's a, that's a good um, that's a good grounding there. I mean, the best way of thinking of templates is, is your own separate app within the app. So at, after the point of login, everything that the user does is effectively a separate app um, that is configurable and can be obviously different in terms of settings, content, branding, et cetera, um, from, from the root and is obviously completely independent of any other templates. So it's like having your own app um, without having to go to all the process of getting an Apple account, Apple developer account and getting it posted to the store and all that sort of stuff. It's like having your own app within uh, the Umbrella Consortium app. And um, as JR, as you mentioned, uh, this only really works if the patrons do know uh, who the consortium is or, or have uh, some sort of visibility of the consortium itself. If the patrons have absolutely no idea about who the consortium uh, is, then it makes it a lot more challenging in terms of saying, hey, go download the Share Consortium or Share Libraries app uh, in the store. Um, so th there has to be some sort of um, cognizance of that uh, branding or at least uh, the awareness of, of, of that app because that's what you're telling people to go download uh, from the store. Uh, and I guess that's the, that's the, the one thing that likes of uh, Belleville who'll have their own app or have their own app in the store. That's, that's the only additional thing is that you have your own presence in the store when you have your own separate app. Uh, this way you effectively have your own app, but it's just 
within the consortium app within the store you don't have to you, you don't have your own presence in the store um it's the consortium that has the presence in the store so that's really the kind of main difference between actually literally having your own app as opposed to the app within an app which is how the templates work but it, having that app within the app means that you can configure everything um entirely uh, and, and tailor it to your particular patrons and i would as a reminder, certainly uh, many of you are aware that given the size and scale of uh, IHLS slash share, that deploying a consortia app probably up front makes a lot of sense, uh, and then look to adding templates as a secondary wave. Another model, we have the South Central Library Consortium in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and they're looking to add templates uh, probably every quarter to six months saying, okay, let's get the main app up first. And then there might be a handful or a few libraries that want to go to a template. And we try to group those together as an activity to make it a little more sane on the uh, folks involved in the deployment. Uh, in terms of for the finance committee on today, uh, while we proposed prices for the templates, uh, we haven't really done anything in terms of a volume discount on that. And certainly we're aware on the public library side, there's uh, eight to 10 larger public libraries. And then there's a, a grouping of academics and K to 12. So I think we could certainly look to a kind of volume discount for uh, templates uh, if we get that far, if that makes sense. Now, one of the questions that I think that we had addressed when we were talking of, uh, in the chat about linking accounts is that you have to have um, somebody provide that information to you that there's a level of trust there there but because we do value confidentiality um, and it is one of the core values um, of of libraries can you talk a little bit about the confidential confidentiality on your end for the app for the mm -hmm. data that's flowing through Sure thing. So uh, all data that goes from our, our app to the ILS goes via our server. Uh, it's encrypted um, fully end to end. So um, the, our app is making a communication with our server using a TLS 1.2 encrypted connection. Our server is then making um, an HTTPS TLS 1.2 encrypted connection to Polaris using the Polaris APIs. Um, which is obviously the, the, the correct way for accessing data from the ILS. We don't do any screen scraping or anything like that, or and we don't harvest um, mark records or anything like that. So if, if you were familiar with either the Boopsie app or kind of older style apps, they, they, they tended to employ those types of um, techniques to, to access the ILS. We don't do any of that. We use APIs end to end. So it's um, it's you know, sanctioned by uh, Polaris, it's, it's sanctioned by Innovative, it's, it's the way that they have designed for us to access that information. In terms of patron private information, we don't store any of that information within our servers. It does pass through our servers. And the reason that we, we have that model is that the app itself doesn't know anything about Polaris, doesn't know anything about ILS, doesn't know anything about uh, your specific events provider or PC booking provider, et cetera. Our server provides a middleware piece that allows us to um, essentially provide a, a single consistent uh, interface for the app. And then that server then makes the connection to your ILS in whichever uh, way your ILS supports. So the Polaris APIs in case of Polaris. The benefit of that is if you ever were to change ILS, then uh, you don't actually need to change the app. All we do is change some settings on our server to point to your new ILS if that was ever something that you even contemplated. Um, although <laughs> it's not something people tend to do particularly frequently, but obviously it's good to know if it's um, if you ever have to do that. But as I said, um, we don't ever store any of the data. It does pass through our system. We also don't store any um, patron um, private specific information. It's things like your account management, um, your holds, your, your checkouts, et cetera. The things that you see within the app there that pass through our system. Um, in terms of uh, privacy, we are classed as a data processor, not a data controller, because we don't ever store or handle any of that data. It just literally passes through. Uh, the system uh, and as I said it is fully encrypted uh, end to end so um, so the, the patrons can be confident that the uh, that their, their data is not at risk when they're using the app. 
Andrew, perhaps you could just show the user interface of what the patron would see and how they would add a, a kind of a trusted partner, whether it's a family member or a senior neighbor for curbside pickup or something. Sure. So if I go back into linked accounts, um, there's an add button at the top right. And effectively, what I see is another login screen, just as I did when I first logged into the app. So I have to enter the borrower number and PIN. Um, I guess the, the term linked account is, is slightly problematic from uh, a library administration perspective because the, the account is not really linked in any way. Essentially, what we have is multiple simultaneous logins to the app. So any account that I have the username and PIN or password for, I can access through the app. Um, in the same way that I could access it uh, without linked accounts, I just I would have to sign out of my account and then sign back in again to that other account. So there's no issues in terms of confidentiality or people getting access to information that they shouldn't have. You need to have um, the username and password or the borrow number and PIN in this case to be able to access that account. And if you had that, you'd be able to access that through the app or through the OPAC anyway. Um, you just, it's just a less convenient way of doing it. What we have here by having the effectively multiple simultaneous logins is you can access um, the information from multiple accounts uh, in one go without having to sign out and sign in all the time. Um, so that there's no linkages in terms of the ILS. There's no um, dependencies in terms of, um, you know, data that I can access as a specific user. Essentially the, the app just has multiple accounts signed in simultaneously. Um, and you can see that in a, in a consolidated view. From the patron perspective, it seems like a linked account. So that's why we call it that. Um, but from an actual, uh, from a system administration perspective, it is effectively just multiple logins signed in at the same time from the same device. Um, so that's how that works. Yeah, a couple of yeah. thanks for that. Uh, Cassandra, you had something you might want to share a uh, question on uh, consortia. Yeah. And then um, Maria, so, after. Thank you. Um, Tina asked a great question. Her question was, you know, well, it's linking to Polaris. How, um, how long do we anticipate remaining with Polaris? And so that's a great question. And if you had asked me maybe two years ago, I would say that we're always keeping an eye out at other um, platforms, or not, excuse me, uh, other ILS vendors because they were not planning on um, fully developing LEAP. However, with the recent change to uh, ProQuest through Innovative remaining as a department within ProQuest, that has changed. LEAP will be fully developed. They actually plan to do that um, uh, in this, there's gonna be quite a few upgrades in this next update. And so with that, that we, anticipate that being the future of our um, ILS and the future of our group. Now, that being said, we always will still keep an eye out of what some of the other groups are doing. Uh, Susan has a really good point of, you know, who could handle the different consortial um, needs that we have. However, I think that we are pretty confident that Polaris and Innovative and of course now ProQuest um, are where we need to be. And one of the things that I thought that was really important um, that Scott Drone Silvers actually had said at one point is a product like this helps us extend the life of our ILS without having to go to a next gen um, platform because I know that they will be continuing to work on uh, different discovery layers with Polaris that we might, might want to look at in the future. But where we are now, this provides so much more service as an overlay than just completely scrapping our ILS and starting new with someone else. So I hope that answers the question. As you can see, um, it was kind of a complicated answer. So I, I didn't want to try to type that all out. Did anybody have any questions on that specifically? Thanks, Tina. Great, and next, um, Maria Dent had a question. And Maria, if you wanted to either unmute and ask, please. Um, actually, I don't have a question. Could it have been someone else? Oh, you had your hand raised there. I'm My sorry, I apologize. No, I was looking, I was following the chat. Sorry, Yes. I'm gonna mute myself now. <laughs> 
Uh, Thanks, there's, Maria. Yes, there's uh, a question on statistics. And Andrew, don't know if you'd be able to fire up, uh, I don't know, a CleveNet or a track or someone uh, while we're, we're talking here to showcase, because I think that's very important. I know that uh, uh, certainly Cher is, is tracking many statistics and data points. And certainly we do capture many of, of those in an automated monthly report. And there's also an opportunity to generate a report from a time period uh, from that perspective. It's, it's in Excel, so very easily shareable or deposit in a SharePoint portal or other zone in the Share ecosystem. Uh, Anita asked a question about ePay as an option for payment services. And Andrew made a comment that uh, ePay is something that we are adding to the functionality of the library app. However, a caveat there is that certainly there's a consortium policy, and I'm not sure if that's kind of on the tech side or the finance committee about how money enters the system uh, from that. So two pieces. One is uh, once we have the technology ready to plug and play with Google Pay and Apple Pay, et cetera, then there'd be another discussion point within the policy of the consortia on how money may enter from that uh, standpoint. So the, the good point is it's very exciting to be more consumer focused because patrons are very familiar with Apple Pay and Google Pay going forwards. And so JR, I think that, and Jill has pointed this out too, that Apple Pay and Google Pay, um, we might have some libraries that are using that individually, but there is a system that a lot of our cities and towns use called Jet Pay. And so that's the one that we primarily is uh, kind of a favored vendor for us. Um, and so that's something uh, I think she was asking if that would be able to be increased. Uh, Tina's asking Venmo and PayPal, um, because those are popular, because there are just a lot of rules on how uh, money can enter in the library's accounts. Um, and they're different for every library, of course, if you're through your city, you're, um, or if you're a district. So there's just a lot of con considerations for that. Yes. Uh, so might just put it back to Andrew here to maybe share the stats yep. report first and then maybe comment on the ePay if there's anything else to add on that to Andrew. Sure thing. Uh, so I brought up the Swan uh, Libraries app. I know they're, they're not too far from, from where you guys are at. So um, they have uh, been live since uh, July last year. Sorry, July year before, July 2019. You can see that from the stats uh, where the, the, the number of uh, devices and launches kind of uh, shoot up at that point. So the, the statistics are available through the CMS at any time. Uh, so that you can go on and run a report for any time period uh, at any time you like. Um, but as a part of the process, uh, on the first of each month, we email out a link to a spreadsheet, so an Excel sheet, uh, like you see here, uh, to whatever email address is specified in the content management system. And the spreadsheet contains essentially the report that you can run online, but in spreadsheet form, and it'll run the report from uh, when the app was first set up up until uh, the last day of the previous month. So we're, we know that most of our customers tend to do their KPIs and reporting based on a calendar month uh, basis. So we provide that that report on a, uh, on a monthly basis at the start of the, the next month. Um, up until the last day of the previous month. So we can see the number of devices. Uh, so in this case, there's been run on 8,500 Android devices, 15,000 iPhones, 3,800 iPads. Um, we can see the number of times that the app has been launched in total. So um, 192,000 times it's been launched on Android devices, 390,000 on iPhones, 44,000 on iPads. Uh, and 632 times on the old iPod touches, there's still a few, a few of those out there. Uh, we can also see the usage over time, so the number of devices, the number of uh, times that the app has been launched in each of those calendar months, uh, and the number of new devices in a particular month. So we can see the, the usage of the app uh, growing there. And uh, moving on down, uh, we can see the API methods that we've called against the ILS. So this allows you to see things such as, uh, so hold create um, is, so the ILS is uh, a physical hold created against the ILS. Uh, the, the ERC one there is uh, electronic resource content. So uh, number of holds created against electronic content items. 
Um, loan create would be checkouts. Loan renew would be uh, checkout renewals. Um, and the number of times it was uh, returned against uh, the uh, SOSAS check-ins as well. Uh, so all the different actions that we can take uh, and this is all documented as to what the various different methods are. Uh, so you can see that uh, detailed out uh, the API methods uh, that are used within the app and then the different sections within the app. So uh, the different libraries are classed as channels in the app. So the number of views each of those channels have had within the app. So we have channels, we have tabs and we have content items uh, and all of those uh, stats are available um, across uh, the app, uh, all the different sections of the app you can see uh, so these guys have a number of templates. So we can see that the, the home screen of the app, the root template has been accessed 77,000 times. The Oak Park public library template has been accessed 38,000 times. Uh, so, you know, and on down. So they're the most popular within Swan. And um, we can see the different sections within the app. So that's overall, we also provide uh, as a second sheet within the report uh, each month, the stats for the, the, the previous calendar month. So in January alone, we can see the number of devices, launches, uh, API uh, usage um, across, um, across that month and, uh, and the, the channel, the, the different page or screen views within the app uh, across that month. Uh, as well. So all that information is provided, as I said, uh, as an email uh, on a monthly basis uh, with that report, but you can go in and, and access these stats at any time uh, from the CMS. So just going back to the, the question about um, uh, payments. So the payments module uh, that's in development right now uh, allows for payments via Apple Pay, Google Pay, uh, direct credit or debit card payments through, through WorldPay uh, or PayPal. Uh, so that's the, 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 the providers that we are integrating with right now. But the way that the, the library would actually receive the funds is not directly through those services. The library would receive a remittance you know, on a period that's defined by the library. So that could be weekly, monthly, daily. Uh, and you receive essentially a single transaction payment along with uh, a report detail. Uh, so that could be provided either as a CSV report or a human readable report um, for what all the transactions that constituted that payment are. So if you have to obviously import that into um, a system for reconciling the, the, the payments, then you can do. Uh, and that can either be on a consortium wide level or individual uh, library level uh, where the, the, the actual payments themselves were actually quite straightforward to do uh, within the app. Uh, the, the work that's ongoing right now is in terms of defining who gets paid when. Um, and, and that's particularly important, obviously, for, for consortia like yourselves. So, you know, I'm a, a patron who belongs to Library A, but the, it's a late fee on, a, on an item from Library B. But uh, I've just returned it to Library C. So who gets the payment? Uh, when, I, when I pay for the, the overdue fine. So there's, there's complexity around that and we're building rules to allow you to define exactly how that works for your library and your consortium uh, and who should get you know, which funds uh, accordingly. So, so that's, um, that's how that works. So it wouldn't be a case of the, the library getting payments from, from PayPal or from Apple or from Google. Essentially it would be a single consolidated payment that the library would receive along with a list of the transactions uh, as to what those um, what those payments, uh, what that consolidated payment consists of. So, um, so that's how that kind of works. Um, there was another question earlier on that I noticed around self-check. Um, so the question was, is a self-check feature determined by the patron's home library, right, library or items, home library options? So self-check is determined by the library you're standing in right now. So if the library that you're standing in right now supports self-check, um, then that is what determines uh, the rules that are available uh, at the time or, or what, what functions are available because we use the user's GPS to determine which library they are literally standing in and then pick up the settings from the CMS that have been configured for that particular library. Uh, in terms of uh, what items can be checked in where, then it would be effectively the same as a check-in through a self-check kiosk because we use uh, the SIP2 connection that self-check kiosk uses for this particular function. We don't use SIP2 for anything else. It's just for checkout and check-in. 
um, uh, and that is uh, until such time the the APIs are available for checkout and check-in from the ILS. Uh, most AP, most ILSs don't have APIs for that, so that's why we use SIP2. But essentially, rules that you define for your self-check kiosk would apply also to uh, self-check within the app because we're using the same method for communicating uh, with the ILS. So um, you know they, they would only be able to return that item to that library. Uh, if they were able, if 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 the if the rules in that library or the circulation rules in that library are de are defined to allow you to to return to that library, for example, so it really does fit in with the existing models and processes and procedures that libraries and ILS vendors and um, uh, self check vendors have defined, you know, have developed over all these years. And so, Andrew, just to expand on that, um, and I apologize, Susan, I'm not familiar with what our existing self-check libraries are doing, but essentially, instead of using the machines, they would be using their phone and nothing would really change. Um, so I don't know if there are any libraries that are using self-check-in. I know there are quite a few using the self-checkout, but the self-check-in, that could certainly be something that we would discuss as part of the circulation committee. Um, but I don't know, I don't know of any libraries that are doing that now, but that, that would be a concern uh, now if they have machines set up to do that, not just with the app. So we could certainly discuss that. Yeah, and I will be happy to put that on our agenda um, and maybe reach out to some of our self-check libraries to see how they have that. And um, I did, I wanted to go back because Rachel had a really good question um, about reciprocal events and announcements if, because we do have so many reciprocal borrowers. So let's say that we have library A um, patron that goes to library B because they work in that town. Could they choose what library that they would see announcements and events at? Or is that driven specifically by Polaris and how they are uh, uh, entered in as a home library? Yeah, so right now the, the template that you see is determined by your home location. Um, it's not something that the user can choose. Um, we do have it on our development list as a, as a potential future option. So that's something that, that is, becomes um, a, a real pain point for some of your patrons. And we can look to, to, to pull that out as, a, as an option. So in preferences, you would just simply have a drop down to say, um, you know, sure, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a member of library A, but I really like the stuff from library B. So change me to library B and then it would just change the template um, and they would then see all the content configuration, color schemes, all that sort of stuff um, from library B. So um, it, it's it's something we, that would be really easy for us to do. We just haven't done it because we've, we've never been asked for that before. Um, but uh, it's something that we when, we, when we first rolled out templates, we kind of thought that this might be something that people may want to do in future. So that it's not locked in there. It's just that we use the home location that we pick up when the when the patron signs in to determine which template they see, but it's absolutely something we could definitely add in future. Okay, I had another question about the um, or not a, another question, but you can um, confirm or deny this, I guess, about <laughs> locations. So some of our academics and schools, and I'm sure our specials would be also be concerned about this. Um, for the location uh, finder, we could probably use language. Um, and exclude our schools and academics and specials from that location finder simply because we know they're not going to be able to come to your, you know, uh, sixth grade library and check out a book if they're a, you know, a 38 year old sure. person. Yeah, so, absolutely. So we would uh, turn that functionality off uh, for and keep it only for our publics. Yeah, absolutely. The, the the list of libraries in the nearest library can be completely configured uh, through the CMS. So uh, we tend to, with, with consortia that have a mix of library types, we tend to actually not import the the library locations for, for those types of locations because, you know, you just, you're never going to want to see them within the app. Now, that doesn't affect the pickup location because that's determined by Polaris as to that user if they're allowed to pick up at that location uh, so the whether the the library is listed in the nearest libraries or not has absolutely no impact as to um, the pickup locations that that particular user is allowed to choose from um, but it, it tends to be the you know the, the special locations or special libraries or academic libraries school libraries prison libraries etc are usually not included in the nearest libraries list because that's not a place you can just turn up at um, uh, and, and use the services. So that's absolutely uh, possible to, to, to not include those within that list. Okay. Now, um, there was a lot of interest in the self-check uh, mm -hmm. features, but one of the questions was, do you have to have self-check 
um, to use the scanning feature. So let's say that I'm at my local Barnes and Noble and I see a book, oh, that looks good. I'm not gonna pay for it, but let me see if my library has it. Could you use that feature to scan the barcode just to place a hold? Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're completely disconnected. Um, the scan, a bar, scan an ISBN feature was um, predates self-check by about seven years. So <laughs> there's, no, there's no dependency whatsoever. Um, the the self-check is, is a completely separate module. Okay. And um, JR is saying that for the payment process, we could do a deeper dive on the uh, JetPay, which is the ePay system for the state. So um, that's really exciting that you uh, already are working on that and how that configures because if it's lost or damaged, it goes to the items um, home, the, the fees would go to that paper, uh, excuse me, the items library, but if it's being checked in um, at a different library than the item, it would go to wherever that book was checked in, they would keep the fees. And so it's good <laughs> that you're looking at those kind of complicating yeah. factors. Yeah, and, and whilst that is necessarily the case right now, because that's where the person is and you don't want to be transferring money around, when it comes to um, using the app for payment, then it actually might allow you to change that policy because um, you're not having to you know, move the money around from different places because you know this is, it just so happens that this is a library where the user paid their cash. Um, if the, the, if the funds are taken electronically, we can associate them with the, you know, cause it, really it should be whoever either owns that item or whoever the, the, you know, the, where the patron belongs to, it's just, it, it'll be wherever they checked it in because that's actually considerably easier when you're talking about dealing with cash. Um, so this actually would give you the option to potentially look at that policy and decide, is that the most appropriate policy or was it just the easiest thing to do because we were dealing with cash and didn't want to, have to transfer that around. So it gives you some options there as well. Yeah, we'll definitely have to talk to um, our finance and policy committee to uh, make some recommendations on that and kind of see what our options are. Did anybody else have any questions if they want to um, either use the chat or just unmute and ask? Just while you've got the stats up there, Andrew, there was a question on if, uh, I guess if, a library did invoke patron self check out that are those transactions available in the monthly report? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the transactions are there and they're actually detailed per location. Um, so I've got Clevenet, I think I'm still sharing, yeah. I've got Clevenets here and that's actually a really good um, example. So if I look at just this month, I can see, um, I don't feel to see that. Let me just uh, change my zoom level. Uh, let's just... So loan create ILS is the checkout method. And you can see it's actually loan create ILS colon. And then, so BTN main is one of their library branch codes. So I can see that there were five checkouts at that particular branch. There were seven uh, at CPL Lorraine. There were nine at uh, Cleveland Public Library main library. Um, so they're, they're all broken down by, um, by location uh, within the stats. Uh, nothing else really is, but the, the checkouts and check-ins, because obviously it really, it really is important to know uh, which locations those, those transactions uh, took place at, then we broke that down uh, in terms of location for the, the checkout and check-in stats. And so we've got some really great questions coming in about just the process. So Beth mm -hmm. asks, what is the expected rollout date? And then Donna asks, does this need to go to membership? And so what we are doing, um, it does need to go to membership for a vote because it involves our fees. And um, even though it is through, like I had mentioned, it will go to our capital, um, or excuse me, our reserve fund for capital improvements for those first three years. And so what we're um, doing now, the Share Finance and Policy Committee is um, has submitted it for member comment. And that's what this uh, demo today is part of. We're going to have this demo as well as a fact sheet, maybe some frequently asked questions. So everybody can um, get familiar with the product before placing their member comment. And if there is interest from that, we will then move on to the Share Executive Council to review and then send out for vote. And so I am hoping if we get to that point that we will be doing that in May with a start date on July 1. And so for the actual process of the uh, rollout, for example, 
with that um, that timeline. And I think that Andrew and JR could probably tell us a bit more because it, it will be some back end work on the share staff side. Um, but for the initial template, um, how long that rollout will take, and then we would probably do, uh, or excuse me, for the base app the time period for that rollout. And then we would also have a second phase of the templates. So that will be after we launch that, that base template. Sure thing. And that, that's, a re, that's a really great way of, uh, of, of approaching it. And in fact, that's exactly what Clevenet did. So um, Clevenet is uh, a consortium uh, around uh, Cleveland and they went live with the app without templates. So they just had the root um, Clevenet app. Uh, and they were live with that for about a year before they then added templates um, subsequently. Um, and, and they've been live with the templates now for about two years. So, um, so that's, that's absolutely um, a good way to go to get, to get the app live, to get your patrons using it, getting the benefits of, of the app, and then adding those templates over time uh, as, as, and when, uh, as and when a library decides they want to, to go for a template. It, it doesn't need to be, you know, everyone gets a template at the same time. So, um, you know, with the, the, Swan Consortium, I think they went with all 97 templates initially, and then they recently added another three libraries, so they're now 100. Um, another consortium that we were work with, SEO Southeastern Ohio, um, they started without templates and they've added, you know, they, I think they now have about 30 or 40 templates, um, but they've been added like two or three at a time over the course of the last two years. So it's, it's, it's not an issue if, if um, different libraries are moving at different speeds, um, we, can, we can absolutely accommodate that. Uh, there was a question there about CMS access. So um, without a template, uh, a library would only have access to CMS to access their own channel. So that would be the library page, uh, you know, their, their library branch page within the app. You wouldn't have access to stats because that's all based on the app, which is kind of what a template is within, within the CMS. So um, if you have a template, obviously you would have a username and password that has access to that template and the stats, et cetera. But um, if you don't have a template, then the most you can have is, is, is a username and password that has access to your channel. Uh, and that, I guess, would be a, a consortium decision as to whether they want to roll that out for, for all libraries where each library has their own username and password to access that. I know there, there are some consortia that do. There are some that don't. Um, some where the, the consortium um, management committee or, or, or headquarters uh, manage the content on behalf of the libraries. So the, the, there, are, there are many different ways that we can configure that depending on how the consortium um, chooses to work. I have a quick question. Can I ask it? Of course. Still. Sorry. Um, can you, if you have two library cards, can you toggle back and forth between a template? So like there's a lot of cases where let's say uh, a patron lives in a smaller community and owns property in a larger community. So they technically can get a library card in both communities. So maybe one library has less e-resources, the other library has more. So they may want to double dip because they legitimately can. <laughs> so could they do that? Yeah, so, so as I said before, the, the template is determined by your home location. And if you have... Um, and sorry, it's determined by the home location of the the primary login. So the first account that you log in with um, is what determines your templates. It it doesn't have anything to do with the any linked accounts that you then subsequently sign in with. Um, it's based on that primary login. I mean, obviously, if you were to sign out of that account and then sign into another account, you would then see the other template. But as I said earlier, we we could look to have the option where you can choose from from templates um, and allow the user to to switch between different templates for different content as well. Um, also, you could you could schedule up if, there, if there's anything that you wanted to make available um, under your library, you could schedule content items under your library page as well. So the users could access that even if they were using a different template, they could still access that those links. Now, obviously, they would they would need to have access to, to, to do anything with those links um, uh, if, if you put those there. But um, there are some options that way as well. But I, I think the the option, if that's a, a common scenario for you, then I think the option where we provide the ability for the patron to choose between different templates uh, sounds like it might be the best uh, best way forward there. Uh, 
Okay, does anybody else have any additional questions? Tina says this is really exciting. I agree, Tina. And I think that I had put in the, you know, event uh, details that I, I was really excited to ship for you all to see this because I just thought that you would be very impressed. So I'm glad that you see that too. Great. Uh, in the chat questions, I've made reference that uh, as a follow-up to this, Cassandra was already planning to send out a uh, follow-up email and we'd have some, some links to the click and collect, which is our curbside checkout option, which is included in the base and as well as some self checkout uh, routines there. So you can see what that looks like. So Cassandra will have those and whenever she's ready to share those with the group that will be done. Yeah, well, I, I'm um, seeing some comments that really like this. We had an earlier comment that this looks great and I think patrons will really like this and I agree. So I'm really excited about this. And so we're gonna be um, getting the recording and uh, some of those videos along with those fact sheets and frequently asked questions. And then from there, we'll be putting it out for member comments. So we'll be sending out an email blast um, it'll probably also be in our newsletter as well for our next month's new newsletter. So keep an eye out. And if you have comments or questions, um, questions, please feel free to reach out because if you have a question, others might as well. Um, and then if you, for those comments, we really, it will um, certainly inform our share finance and policy committee as well as our share executive council on our decision making. So please do include your comments um, on the share website as well. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Andrew, Neil, and JR. We really appreciate you um, taking the time today to show us the app. And it's very exciting of the, thinking about just the potential that we have here. So um, it was great to see you all today. It was great to see everyone here um, attending to view this. And we look forward to um, sending out information to everyone. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye.